Thank you so much, Barry. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great to see how Barry's been shepherding the community here. And thank you so much, Patrick, for, for this as well. Um, so I'll give you just a, an overview of some of the project to product concepts. Actually, you know, this is smaller groups, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions as we go as well, uh, if you're curious about anything. But basically, the, it, a lot of the project to product journey um, for me uh, came from my background doing some doing research. And I was researching producti software productivity. I did that as a, I did some of that um, after finishing my undergrad. I did a lot of it for my PhD. And I realized that when I was doing my PhD, I realized I was, did not want to be an academic. I, I actually liked building working, real working software, and especially software that was, that was large scale and interesting. And so I was trying to uh, finish my PhD more quickly because I, I was realizing I was not wanting to be an academic. And so I asked my supervisor, Gail Murphy, uh, who was at the University of British Columbia Software Practices Lab, uh, how can I finish my PhD more quickly? And she said, well, <laughs> you, if you could just demonstrate that all these crazy ideas that you have actually make a difference in people's productivity, uh, then your thesis committee might let you finish more quickly and you know, start this company you're wanting to start. And, and so I said, okay, well, how do I do that? And she said, well, you have to figure out how you can measure people's productivity. And I said, well, how, how do we measure programmers' productivity? How do we measure software productivity? I mean, I, I know people complain about lines of code, and no one really cares how many builds happen in a day unless you're doing them once, once a month. Um, so, uh, so she said, well, uh, uh, there's actually not been enough on that. We, we, you know, we should actually find a methodology for measuring people's productivity. So this interesting thing happened where I spent a good chunk, probably about a third of my PhD work in looking for ways to measure productivity at scale by looking how developers worked. And I became, this is kind of a, a thread that's not that big in the book, but that's been a really big part of my motivation. And so when I was doing those hundreds of meetings with IT leaders, asking them, you know, how, how do you, you're investing tens of millions, hundreds of millions, in some cases billions of dollars in your IT transformations, your agile transformations, your DevOps initiatives, how are you measuring whether they're working? And I realized I was getting an even, you know, even worse answer than I was getting from academic circles at the time, which is no one had any clue how to measure productivity. They did not know if this, this outsourcer was better than that outsourcer, if this team was more productive than that team. There was no business level of measuring productivity. And there was a, there's a big problem with that because if you're not measuring productivity, I would then ask a follow-on question. So, so where's your bottleneck? Your, You've got these massive initiatives, um, you're insourcing, you're outsourcing, you're moving to cloud, you're going to agile, you're going to DevOps. Uh, is that your bottleneck? Where is your bottleneck? Where should you staff up? Where should you invest? And again, there was at, at the leadership level, there was never a clear sense for what the bottleneck was. And I realized that this is a really big problem when you don't know what to measure, when you don't know where your bottleneck is, but when your people are complaining, the teams are realizing that, that things are getting in their way, and at an organization level, you don't know where to invest. And so I've now you know, come to the conclusion that if we don't find a much better way to measure what we deliver, to look for the bottlenecks, and then to get the impediments out of people's ways, we're not going to improve in any systematic way. And this is why I think we've had so many missteps and sidesteps and, and challenges, and in many cases, organizations going backwards in their transformations. So I'm going to kind of skip that well-worn Nokia story and just go into this, this Big Bang story. Um, so this is, I think, a pretty typical example. This is one of the, the, the threads in the book where this bank is now on its third transformation. And it's now with DevOps, so it's not just an agile transformation, so we're, we're in much better shape. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I realized that the way everything is being measured is through project management. And uh, project management is that measurement layer. So budgets and costs and activities are the measurement layer. And if you think back to you know, Stuart's talk just a moment ago, in the, in the Kinefin framework, uh, you might realize that if you've got some very certain work that you can decompose into two-year roadmaps and allocate resources perfectly to those because there's so much certainty in what you're doing, not the kind of complexity that we deal with in software, project management can work. That's why it's, it's useful for making buildings and, and bridges and shards and things of that sort. Uh, but when we've got uncertain work, when you don't know exactly how the technology stack is going to change, you don't know exactly how quickly your, your talent pool will ramp up or, or will learn, uh, it becomes a really big problem. And so in this example, two years later, the transformation had failed yet again. And it had failed. So by the way, it was called a success. 
Um, <laughs> so it was internally communicated as a success because it had delivered on the budget reduction because this organization, like so many, uh, has such low levels of productivity that their IT budgets have just exploded uh, without getting much more value. So they keep investing in places where they're not getting a return in IT. And, uh, and, but yet, after the transformation was done, the, I interviewed a series of people. I learned how to do these, these kinds of more structured interviews through my, through my PhD. And I got the same answer from every single person I interviewed, which is, transformation's done, we've hit our goals, uh, now IT is delivering, I, we feel like IT is delivering even less than before. Mm -hmm. Or within IT, and this was both, the, the fascinating thing was it was multiple leadership levels and both the business side and the technology side. So both the, bo in both the lines of business and, and the IT people saying the same thing. And so I realized, well, what's going on here is that they're trying to change, they're trying to improve, everyone's bought in. Like we're talking about a trend, what was so fascinating about this one was, I've been part of many that were you know, in the hundreds of millions. This one was a billion dollars invested in the transformation. There are multiple of these going on right now um, across the industry, many of them. And so basically, if you look at it from in terms of value delivered improvement, it's a billion dollars gone up in flames. And how can you actually have a billion dollars go up in flames? This, was this, this question uh, was that what motivated me to write the book. Um, Adrian Jones, back there, my colleague, was actually, we, we were struggling with this as, you know, as we were walking through how they could have done this. So we were you know, talking through this. And I, when we had the original meetings with this organization, I realized they were, they were going to fail. This was going to be the outcome because they don't know how to measure value. All they're measuring is costs and activities. And if you don't have a value measure, how can you possibly improve or help, in the end, help your people improve how much value they deliver? So this really big theme of the whole project to product movement, and I've you know, realized it's, it's an increasingly important thing to, to focus in on in the first steps of, of getting these journeys on footing, is that if, if you're measuring the wrong things, and the wrong things are project management and cost centers, right? It's not that you don't stop doing projects, you don't stop measuring cost, but if that's all you're measuring, you will go sideways or worse. Uh, you'll take steps back, as happened here. So the, the interesting thing that's happened is that some organizations know how to measure value in software, and most enterprise organizations do not. They do not know, for example, of this you know, one set of one part of the organization, this one region, is delivering twice as much value to the business as this other. And the challenge is that, of course, as the technologist, we have a sense when, when we're delivering more value. When we're hitting our plans, we're hitting our goals on our roadmaps, and we're, we're able to manage the, the tech debt that we've got or to replatform when we need to. But the ways of measuring value uh, from agile just do not match the way businesses look at me measuring value. So these vocabularies that we have that use for ourselves, like story points, they might work for us. When I first uh, told my new CFO, well, four years ago he was, he was my new CFO, about story points. I think for a moment he wanted to quit. And he thought he'd <laughs> come to work for some land of fairy tales and things. Because he had come from lean manufacturing, where they had very disciplined ways of measuring value, uh, not these fluffy sounding story points that I was, I was talking to him about. So I realized that we were, you know, story points, by the way, we continue to measure them. Well, we use a lot of the scaled agile frameworks and the Scrum practice is a task stop. But I realized that at his level, at the finance level, this is not a sensible way of measuring value. It's very good for our prioritization, but it's too low in the weeds uh, for him, for the business side. So what's been so interesting, of course, is that some companies in the industry have become very good at measuring and managing to value. And so this, by the way, this, uh, just, just yesterday, uh, someone at TASTOP did some work. This change is even more stark now in terms of stock price changes. This is the 2016 timeframe. But you've got a company, like Amazon in this case, who knows how to measure value in its software value stream, has aligned its software architecture to the way it delivers value, and of course has aligned its, its you know, um, through microservices, uh, and has aligned its organizational structure to that. And you compare those other companies on the right, and these are kind of early warnings indica indicators of what ha in retail of what happens when you don't do these things the right way. Each of those companies is undergoing a digital transformation, right? Each of those uh, companies is, is putting in place DevOps practices, but they're coming from IT being a cost center to the business, 
and they haven't at an organization level, at a, at a business and manager level, learned how to measure and manage to, to value. And this is, a, this is becoming just a very stark problem, right? Half of the S&P is projected to be replaced in 10 years. Um, as you just heard, uh, there's been over a trillion dollars spent by banks on digital transformation, and the majority of that has not reaped any rewards, right? 70% of those transformations have not delivered measurable results. So the question is, you know, how can we do this differently? And how can we basically shift from this cost center mentality and measuring the wrong things to measuring value? So uh, I realized, you know, I, as I was studying this problem and I'd read all the lean literature and the tiered production system and all of that, um, I was trying to figure out how this has happened before, right? How other organizations uh, have approached this and really how other disciplines have come to measure value. So actually Adrian and I went and visited the BMW Leipzig plant. BMW was one of our largest customers at the time. And we, we were there for two days. We got a chance to ask all these questions. And the really interesting thing about it was that we, got, we had a chance to interact with you know, both the business side and the, the production side. And what was so fascinating to me about the way that value is measured in manufacturing was that A, there was no Gantt charts or project plans in sight unless someone was making new plant or, or a new part of an assembly line, but just the way that the lean principles were embodied in this organization. And so the lean principles in the end are all about measuring value and a, they basically provide us with a template for how you measure value. So these are taken straight from Jim Womack's book, and they are precisely specify value by product. So the interesting thing is a product is something that embodies a customer need. Yeah? Quick question. Um, could you clarify what you mean by value? Because you keep, you keep referring to it a lot. It seems to be a very important word, but value means different things to different people in different contexts. So what could, could, it might help if you clarify what you mean by value. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, that's a great point. So every organization is responsible for defining it, its, its value to the market, right? Its value should be des defined by its customer. So I'll go through this list and I'll go back to that. So we'll hold on that word value. So precise to specify value by product, identify the value stream, so the way value flows for the product, make value flow without interruptions, and let the customer pull value from the producer. So it's that last bullet that addresses the question of value. Value is what you deliver to a customer. So value is not about what you produce. The value is meant to be oriented around what the, what the customer pulls, what the market pulls. So how would you say that means for BMW? So for BMW, the definition of value is very clear and it's on its posters in the production line, right? Which is, it's these cars that deliver sheer driving pleasure. So the more of those are pulled, and the more their polls versus their competition, the more value is del delivered to BMW's customer and to the business and to their, to their share price, right? You can have a government where, you know, a, a, a federal institution, a government institution, where the, the value that needs to be delivered is citizen services, right? Is, is easier way of uh, submitting forms or, or, or filing your taxes and so on. You could have a not-for-profit where, you know, again, the value is delivered through some digital offering. But so every business has, exists because it has defined, or every organization, some measure of value for itself. And so the question in you know, how we measure value according to lean principles is actually being able to, to create that structure, those product value streams, and then making that value flow to the customer based on their pull as efficiently as possible. Did that answer the value question? Yeah. So that the, and, and then, but you'll see this actually this interesting dichotomy between flow and value uh, when I get to the flow framework, because connecting flow to value uh, is is an interesting thing. So, the the way you articulate this, it sounds like uh, for commercial organizations, you can always use revenue as a proxy for, for value. Right. So the, the the statement was that for commercial organizations, you should always be able to use revenue as a proxy for value. So revenue is one of tends to be one of the value metrics, right? But it's, it's, it's not always the only one. So let's say that you've got a, you know, a technology startup, right? Their, their number one metric might be daily active users as a value measure because they would 
they're happy burning crazy amounts of money to gain daily active users that they can advertise to later, right? So th they're deferring, deferring monetization. But yeah, for, for most uh, commercial businesses and public, obviously for public companies, there is some metric of value that has to do with revenue or e EBITDA and ratio of you know, your spending to your, uh, to your earnings. There's a really good book um, under the same publishing label as Mick's uh, IT Revolution called The Art of Business Value by Mark Swartz and uh, he talks about value at length and uh, you know, the different complexities of that. You know, so it's not, generally, not always about uh, business value, it might be that, you know, for example, uh, value to the shareholders is actually closing down some services like in like the Royal Mail, for example, the post office closing down you know, some of their like, you know, um, uh, offices in remote locations isn't offering value to customers, but it is to their, like, you know, the people who are uh, profiting from, from that business. And also, like some, some CEOs or, or founders of organisations don't necessarily do things for monetary value, they do things for the community, and they, so it's, it, it's a completely different measure from the monetary sense. But I re really recommend that book, The Art of Business Value by Mark Swartz. He's a, it's a really good book. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's, you know, there, there's been recent uh, work in stakeholder value, not just shareholder value. Uh, uh, a month ago, there's an issue of The Economist about that. But the bottom line is the business understands value and somehow that value has to be mapped to software value streams. So I'll actually, I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment because I think this is a key question. Yeah? I mean, this sounds great at, at the big level, yeah? How much money the company's making, whether the cars are selling. But if you're a small development team in a big company and your remit is to deliver a platform for something, it's very hard to get that. You know, that's not generating any revenue for anyone. It's an internal system. How do you motivate those people to deliver value? How do you measure that kind of value? That's a great question. So I'm going to, and I'm going to just hold that question. Okay, because I, I, I think it's a, it's a key question I'll try to answer. And I'll tell you how we do it and how some other organizations I know do it. So, so contrasting, so I'm going to just, let's, let's just take a, a look at the difference in how we look at production in car IT, where we've got extremely mature both production systems and value generating machines, right? More quality cars results in more revenue, which results in more value to the, you know, to the organization. So it's, it's, I think we can wrap our heads around it really easily. So I think contrasting these two things, we see everything is around these integrated production lines that deliver this value versus what we often see, which has this, been this focus on functional specialization in IT organizations that's come from this cost center mentality that's caused these silos. And of course, there's the, the very large silo between kind of the business side and the IT side, but within, even within IT, we'll see these silos. Um, a really big part of that is it's actually been managed by virtue of coming from these call centers. It's been managed as these projects that are long lived, that don't adapt, rather than being managed to products where value is specifically defined for each product and where additional flow of whatever is being produced is correlated to the value being delivered, right? If BMW has a car in the market that's not selling or any car company, guess what? That car will be end of life. If I'm fast forwarding a little bit here, but if Google has a product out there that's not getting adopted, like at the rate that, uh, that you know, at the rate that matches um, or justifies its cost, say like Google Wave, uh, it gets axed like that car, right? Like whatever, the Z4 that, that VW had. Um, the everything, and this, this is a fascinating one, everything in BMW is architected around the flow of value. This notion of, you know, one large enterprise architecture to meet every current and future need would be very foreign when you're actually trying to optimize value streams for individual product lines and you're happy with some duplication and things of that sort. So that, that's another one I'll come back to. Everything's optimized end to end because of course you're optimizing to how much value flows. And this is the key thing is all measurement is around the business value delivered. So we'll get back to what that metric might be, but rather than measuring stages of development, every value stream has its customer defined and its business metrics and KPIs defined. So and it's very clear. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, in the, uh, you know, take a, take in that plant that, that Adrian and I saw, uh, they were making the one and two series. And the one and two series, the business value is pretty important because it's BMW's top line, right? So 
everyone building that car knows that if, if, there's not, if cars are not being produced at every 70 seconds from that line, BMW will have a problem, right? It'll have a top line problem. They might not meet their deliveries and their promises to their customers for how many of those cars um, have to get delivered. That plant in Leipzig has to deliver nearly a thousand of those cars a day. Uh, what surprised me was that the i8, which I thought would be the um, most elaborate car, uh, the most elaborate production processes, the highest levels of automation, was completely different. So whereas the 1 and 2 series line is you know, probably, I don't know, Adrian, you must have walked about 10 kilometers. On my watch, it's about 10 kilometers that we walked on that line. So it's very long. Every step takes 70 seconds. That's the tack time. The i8, the line was just a few hundred feet long. Every manufacturing step, step took 30 minutes and was performed by generalists. And the business value specified for that value stream was for BMW, it was for learning. BMW had to learn how to play disruption defense against Tesla, make its own electric cars, and learn how to produce electric cars. And actually, what's, what's so fascinating about this is once that business goal was achieved of learning how to build electric cars, they actually sunset the i8. So in September or October, I think they announced that the i8 is reaching its end of life. They'll keep, if you need one, you better buy it quickly. <laughs> so I think it's another year or something. I forget exactly what they said, that they're going to be actually running that line. But the business goal was achieved. BMW now know how to produce electric cars. So very different sets of business values specified for these different value streams. Right? Whereas if we don't take this value stream centric approach, this, this product value stream centric approach, uh, we end up having CIOs and others ask, well, should we containerize everything that we have? Should we move to microservices tomorrow? That's, that's very different to how BMW would think where different product value streams have different sets of business value specified for them. So we should probably just you know, contrast quickly because cars, turns out, are a little bit different than software. So if you look at flow, it's very easy to understand the flow of value. And again, we're going to... Uh, you know, stay on this topic, at the BMW plant, right? It's those cars that deliver, sheer driving pleasure, um, but there's something very, very different to how cars work and how software works in terms of the design and production cycles that seems very obvious, but it, it really struck me when I was at this plant and felt like this, this mind-blowing epiphany, which is that the design and the delivery happens in two different cities, in two different buildings, and it's two completely different processes, right? So the design takes a year or two, they're trying to make it faster. Uh, the delivery take is, is, happens every 70 seconds. And so the creative and the manufacturing process of delivering value are completely decoupled. They're two totally separate business processes. And they flow across this, in the end, thinking back to Kinefin, this, this, uh, you know, this complicated but not, not quite a complex production line, right? Nothing is changing in production. They've tried to remove all variability. It's completely reproducible. They can go and stand up another one in another region when they want, in China, wherever. Um, if we think about how business value flows in IT, where we've got very high variability work, we've got very complex work, um, w you know, what, what is it that we're delivering, right? Are we delivering releases to our customers? No, no one cares how many releases there are anymore. They only consume software, they only pull software, and there's more value. You only want that new app or an update to that app if there's something in it that benefits you, be that it works better because there are fewer defects in it, uh, or it's got features that delight you. Uh, the way that we create value in software actually is a, is a creative discipline because we can automate away all of the production steps, right? And that is the whole point of continuous integration, continuous delivery and DevOps, is we automate away all of the repeatable steps in our delivery pipelines as much as possible. And then the majority of the work, and this is exactly what happens in, in high performing tech companies, is actually the creative work of de designing, uh, building, uh, creating the software. And we can do that now in daily cycles, right? It's possible to deliver features in, in, in daily cycles today. So the, creating, the creative and the manufacturing process are actually one in how we create value for organizations. And they flow across, not this production line, but when we've actually measured and visualized, we try doing all these different visualizations of our customers' value streams. So we're able to see our customers, we connect up to all their tools, all the agile tools, the support desk tools, the, the project management tools, uh, the quality management tools, and so on. And as we were trying different visualizations, uh, we realized that what we were seeing when we were you know, trying to model out, well, how does this bit of value flow from business idea to, to customer result? 
uh, that what we were seeing was actually a, a network where the nodes of the network are our teams and the, the people in our organizations and they have dependencies between them and those dependencies they include meetings, <laughs> um, but those dependencies are basically where information is created. Those teams create value and they deliver that to the customer. So we've got this uh, value stream network. And so the key thing that the flow framework uh, does is it defines basically four types of value that we deliver through software and that we can then deter determine how those correlate to uh, success in the market to some kind of business value something for our customers. So I'll basically take you through what those four flow items are uh, and then show you how we can, again, map them to determine whether increasing flow drives more business value uh, or not. So the four flow items, and if you're, you're familiar with the scaling frameworks like Safe or DAD or Nexus or any of those things, uh, just imagine these layering on top of that. So you might have a few dozen different work item types in Safe each, every single one of those work item types will map onto one of these flow item types. The four flow items are features, so that's new business value, that's you deliver to your customers, and it's pulled by the customer. And remember, these all have to be around pull, not, not around our activities, but around benefits that we deliver. Defects, so the more defects we fix, uh, the, you know, the more pull there'll be from the customer who can now use the software. And this assumes, by the way, that sufficiently complex software always have, any sufficiently complex system always have defects, always has defects. So the higher rate of fixing those, the better the adoption. Uh, risks, risks are now a first class part of software delivery. So that's gonna be security, data privacy, compliance, uh, and debts, technical debt. Whenever you're doing feature work, any other kind of work, your debts increase and proportionally more of your work has to go into reducing those debts, otherwise they will rise too quickly. So these four flow items are mutually exclusive and comprehensively exhaustive, they're MISI, which means you do more of one, you do less of the other. And collectively they represent all value that's delivered by, by software organizations. So, and then of course the whole point is that increasing the flow of these flow items should drive a better business result. If you've got faster time to market on features, you should get a better business result than if it's slower. And I'll show you how the flow framework uh, measures that in a moment. So any, uh, any questions on the four flow items? Took a long time to get down to four, but <laughs> years. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll, uh, I'll give you a quick, just a really quick example on, on how there is zero sum game. So you know, in the end, more features should deliver uh, more value in the product, right? The product could be very late in its life cycle and you don't actually need to manage as, as much the feature delivery. You could get into maintenance mode, but anytime you're pushing something new to market, anytime you need to innovate, the amount of features you deliver will determine the success of that thing. As that happens, debts and risks rise, quality goes down as debts and risks rise, and defect work goes up. And what happens in this scenario, and I've been there more times than I care to admit, is that defect work will start consuming an entire product value stream because there's so much technical debt. And as that happens, feature work goes down to zero, and we're in the situation that so many I enterprise IT organizations are right now, which is they, they cannot innovate on top of the software base that they have right now. It's so filled with technical debt that creating new, or there's such a big misalignment between the architecture and the code base mm -hmm. that they can no longer um, innovate on top of that code base. It's using old frameworks, it's very hard to create user interfaces on top of that, and so on. So just as a counterexample, but of course, the big challenge is, is that teams tend to understand this, right? Teams tend to understand when they've built up so much technical debt. The issue is that leadership doesn't. So the reaction to this is then to hire more people to work on that thing or bring on more contractors to work on that thing and you're actually not getting any more out. And this is that whole problem of not understanding your bottleneck because you're not measuring one of the key parts or one of the four pillars of, of, of delivery, which is technical debt. And you're not giving, if you're not giving your team a chance to, pay, to take down that technical debt by adding new APIs, by doing some replatforming and so on, then you, can, you never get out of this, this death spiral. And basically, almost pretty much every company has been there, has, has gotten to this point. The question is, did they actually notice this in time at the business level or not, right? 
LinkedIn, Twitter, Etsy, all these are all stories of replatforming. Re Some are successes, and they're, they're tech companies, they're failures, right? Uh, Netscape did not do so, so great in the end with its, uh, with six. So the, here's an example of this being understood at a business level, because the whole point of project to product and the flow framework is to provide the business side, leadership, and teams, and IT, and the delivery side with the same measurement framework where things like technical debt are understood and can be invested in together. So this was just, a, you know, to me, an amazing story when back in 2003, <laughs> Bill Gates said, released a trustworthy computing memo and said, we're going to stop all feature work across all our value streams, effectively is what he communicated to the whole company, which, you can, you know, if you think of your own company's leadership, that's not sure that you hear that kind of thing too often. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, and of course, this is at a time where they, they have a ton of competitive pressure coming at them. Um, but they did that. Is, is the difference there uh, in attitude, I guess, in support from the CEO, uh, coming from the fact that the CEO of the companies you mentioned successfully re-architected their way into the future of profitability. They were all software engineers, right? They, you know, from Jack Bezos to, um, you know, everybody that you mentioned in the unicorn companies that that had a pause and of future work and you know, understood what actually made the company tick. It's really hard to see any company that has not had a difficult past to actually comprehend that future work. You know, we can take the talk obviously to very intelligent executives, but actually the understanding that companies through the work of the teams, through the flow of IT work, is really remote. Um, I, just, I, I don't see any, um, any kind of miraculous learning experience that will say, yes, we get it. You know, is it the only way for these companies to become digital, to have an engineer CEO? So I think that, that's a great question. Uh, and so just a fact, you take all the tech giants, and you know, they only exist in, in two countries, US and China. Uh, the, ev the CEO of each one of them is a former developer, software engineer, right? So that's just a fact right now, right? Is that the companies who have succeeded at these kinds of decisions uh, have been led by people who understand these dynamics. So I was having this, that the same question that you just posed is, can, is it possible for leadership of today's traditional businesses to actually understand the dynamics of software and lead their companies the right way? Uh, and you know, when I was still deciding whether to write this book or not, I was actually speaking with Gene Kim and he said, well, you know, what, what, maybe what we do is we just wait for all those people to retire. <laughs> And, uh, and I was taking, I still don't know if he was serious or not, and I still haven't dared to ask, but, but you know, we were actually playing this out, and we actually, you know, we like, looked at how many years that would take, and in the number of years it will take today's leadership to retire, uh, at the rate of disruption that we have, a lot of companies will go the way of you know, Sears, and, and those other, you know, you'll, will, they'll just decline. Um, and a lot of them will actually go out of business and get disrupted. So basically the challenge for Project to Project became, for me, is how we get today's leaders and organizations to think in, in terms of these kinds of dynamics of software, right? To understand that if we invest in tech debt reduction, and maybe we do it the way Amazon had to do it and replatform our whole monolith and do it in such a great way we get AWS as an outcome of that. Um, or maybe we, have, we do what, what uh, Microsoft had to do, which was far more complex in a sense, because they have more legacy software than any of your companies do, right? They, they started the age of software in the 70s, right? So they, they just, by definition, have more legacy. Uh, and they had to do this across a massively complex product portfolio. But they did it, their debts and risks declined, quality went up, and they've created the most valuable uh, software company on the planet. So, so the question that the Flow Framework asks is how we get the understanding that we have because I think in this room, you, you get the lean concepts, you get the agile concepts, but we need our organizations and our leaders uh, to think this way as well. We need technical debt to be understood by anyone uh, directing software investment. Because if it's not, you could be directing your company into the ground, as, as so many former leaders have done when they didn't understand these aspects of software. 
So that is actually the, the entire goal of the Flow Framework, to take some of the knowledge that, that, that we have in our experiences building software and what it means to take you know, 10 different shortcuts to get a feature to market, uh, but then knowing we have to deal with those shortcuts and resolve that tech debt versus having the next set of 10 features, features piled onto us. So the way that the Flow Framework addresses this is by measuring these flow metrics. So we've got flow distribution. It's those four types of the four flow items, features, defects, risks, and debts. Uh, we measure the distribution of those. So we define and model, and this is not value stream mapping where you do it on the whiteboard. You actually have to do it on top of your kind of live software, your, your tool chains where work is being done today, on, basically on top of your fact, factory floor. And for each product value stream, you measure the ratio of features, defects, risks, and debts. I'll, I'll give you an example in just a moment. And then you define for this particular product value stream if you need to have fast feature flow because you're competing against some fintech startup and you're a bank uh, and you want to move fast, well, guess what? You probably can't get that rate of feature flow that you want unless you go cloud native. And that's why they're getting such a fast feature flow. Now, if you've got some backend system that's just doing some batch processing that you don't care about, well, maybe you optimize that older product value stream just for risk reduction and defect work, right? So you actually make decisions the way BMW makes decisions, which is by the business needs of this product value stream, when one that some of them might just be uptime. Others, you might need to have a lot of innovation um, and a lot of active user growth, for example. And so you define that for each product value stream. You define the value metric. And this, is, this now goes back to the point is that everyone working on that product value stream needs to understand that value metric. Right? Uh, one of my close colleagues, uh, uh, actually a close friend of mine, um, Kaiu Metzel, uh, I, I worked with him on Eclipse, and he did the Eclipse editor. Then he he did he leads VS, he made VS Code, and now he leads VS Code. For those of you that know that that pretty amazing tool, and uh, I met with him a year ago, and I said, so you know, how do you guys do your your objectives, key results? Is how a lot of tech companies manage flowing down business value from business plans and company goals right down to the team level. And he goes, oh, uh, you know, f for us, it's it's two day active users. That's that's all my team cares about right now. I said, well, like, what, what about all the features? You know, are you, aren't you going to add all those features you had in the clips in the Java editor? He's like, nope, we just have to get, get the milliseconds down per keystroke and get to daily active users, right? So they had a very clear, for VS Code at that point in its, in its time, to prove out that you could have a development environment in the cloud at scale um, and actually have the user growth to, to make that become kind of the, the Microsoft's best development environment. So everyone on his team knew uh, that measure of value. You've got a cost metric, which is the cost for your entire product value stream, a quality metric, uh, which is, again, you decide those metrics. So that could be an incident metric, an escape defect metric, and then a happiness metric, because this is creative work. And if your developers are struggling with a monolith or with technical debt, guess what? Their employee engagement scores are going to be lower, or for us, we measure employee net promoter score. Then those on the product value streams that have had a chance to reduce their technical debt, as an example, who are happier and who are doing better work and delivering more for, for your customers. So that's happiness of the employees? Yes. The yeah. It's happiness of the employees rather than the clients. Now, you could, of course, make customer net promoter score a metric for um, a, a value metric as well. But the key thing is because this is creative work, this is not installing wiring harnesses into a BMW, which is very hard work, but, but not creative work. Uh, measuring the happiness, actually, you'll, you know, you'll see that the teams that have a higher happiness metric tend to produce more value than the ones who have a lower happiness metric. So that's why I made it a core part of the flow framework. So basically, the whole idea is that you measure these flow metrics, and then you have these business value metrics that are correlated to them, right? It's not like you can trace a straight line. And of course, we try by putting business cases on features and epics and so on. That's not the flow framework. You, you can keep trying to do that. We still try to do that. Um, but, uh, but this actually gives you a, a, a more an aggregate, higher level view. So you, for example, see if we cut our flow time, that's how long it takes us from end to end, from all the way from customer request or business idea to running software in production. That's flow time. It's all, all the flow metrics are end-to-end -end for value streams because because they're the customer's point of view, not not our own. Um, so if we cut the flow time in half, did we actually get all those daily active users? As and that that actually that is one thing that that did happen. Let's say to the with the example of VS Code, right? Their their users grew and grew, or 
uh, if you see that your, bit, your value metric's not going up, A, you could have the wrong value metric, which, which means every single person working on this thing is do, probably doing the wrong thing. Um, or B, you could actually have a, a market problem, right? If, you're, if you've just you know, launched this you know, great new mobile application and nobody cares, maybe they've moved on and they're on to some other startup solution or something. But the key thing is, is that you see those and that your investments in software and scaling and tooling and hiring and so on um, really have to do with improving your flow metrics and then seeing how those drive your, your business results, right? Any investment in uh, architecture API well, that should you know, drive up the, the happiness metric for developers for whom it's now easier to deliver value and to create features. So that's really the whole idea, which is you track flow, um, you track the correlation to business results, and then you optimize around uh, improving flow to drive those. So if you're using Jira, these could just be four types of Jira, features, defects, risks, effects. Yeah, so that's, so I, the answer to that is, so the question is, could, could they just be, do you just make four Jira issue types? And, and the answer to that is usually no, because these are meant, unless you're a very small company. If you've got one small team, you can probably do that, but these need to be bigger than that, right? A feature for, even, you know, even for us, um, a single feature here could correlate to like 30 Jira issues, uh, four support tickets, and then five items in our product management tools that customers have been asking for, and then 18 Salesforce requests or something. So these are meant to be bigger and to span more broadly um, the end-to-end -end value stream. So, that's, so how do you define the product? I think one of the traps I see many organizations falling into is they think the application is the product. Yes. Obviously yeah, and that's a, ma that's a big, big problem. Um, so if we've, you know, I've, so I was just at a car manufacturer last week, um, one of the well-known car manufacturers. They got very excited about project to product. They defined their product portfolio, and the way they did that is they took their entire application portfolio and made a hierarchy out of it. And that's not the right thing. It's a, you know, it can be a place to start, but it's not the right thing. So you need to, again, you, you need to, you know, you need to think backwards. You need to, to think from the customer point of view, and, and you need to architect this product portfolio you can start with your applications or you can start with the, the way your agile teams are organized. Uh, but then you really need to, as you move to more and more of a product mindset, you start to create these stable product value streams. And so we know some attributes of successful product value streams. For example, we know that uh, they tend to be between one and 10, supported by one and 10 agile teams. If you go over 10, you're getting over that scrum of scrums level and you're getting, it, it's becoming very difficult to manage, right? And Google. Can't, still doesn't put more than 100 developers on search because it's just it's unmanageable. So you'll end up making a separate product value stream rather than trying to make a value stream with 20 teams. Um, we know that each person should only ever work on a single product value stream because the work we do is so complex. It's, it takes that much time to master, to learn to work with our teams, to you know, storm them and form and so on. Uh, so, so you end up defining these product value streams they should, again, be aligned to your team structure and your business results, your funding model, and so on. Uh, you should be measuring those results. And then, but it's, it's, you need to start somewhere. So even if you start from taking your application portfolio, but use this heuristic, right? I, I will not have a person working on more than one product value stream. You'll start heading in the right way. Barry, how much longer do you want me to go before I start taking questions? That was a joke. Okay. <laughs> And I can keep taking questions. So, so I'm going to give you um, just a couple, I'll give you a, a couple quick examples. So we looked at, um, with a customer, you know, we measured their different, they actually, they defined their product value streams and they were able to do it quite well. They had a sort of long, this is nationwide insurance, long lean, uh, lean thinking philosophy there. And across there, they have got a couple hundred product lines which map onto their business, which they actually did align their agile teams to, which is impressive. Um, and we measured how long it took <coughs> to deliver value to customers. And this is, this is going to get back to the point on Jira and the point of how important things are, uh, it is for things to be end to end. So it's taking 120 days to deliver value. And of course, some insure tech startup out there is delivering value faster, so why can't we move faster? And the CIO wants to hire way more developers. Then, if you start looking at where that time was spent, which you're able to do by actually looking at all these systems, two and a half percent of the time was spent in development. 
So that's two and a half days out of 100 days, because the way flow time works is just calendar time, it's, it's calendar time, it's wall clock time, uh, was spent in development. So this basically means that if you invest in hiring more developers, you just wasted your company's resources. Right? Because they had such major upstream bottlenecks with developers, when you see dig into this, constantly waiting on business analysis and meetings getting rescheduled four times before anyone, you know, some requirements were clear. And then all these manual security reviews that developer, and of course what developers were doing busy work during this time, but value creation time on flow items um, was, was just this. You remove those constraints and all of a sudden, you know, the teams become happier, they're delivering more value, it's more visible and you've done it without growing the developer population at all, right? They had some, and once you start looking at actually where those wait states are, uh, you see fascinating things like, well, you know, guess how long developers are waiting on wireframes? And it's a lot more, you know, they're waiting on those wireframes a lot longer than they are actually writing code. So, um, so these things become visible once you start tracking flow time. And flow time, again, it's, it's, it's tracked end to end. You've got cycle time, how long it takes to open and close a Jira issue, um, a user story, let's say, but this is tracked, has to be tracked end to end from the customer's point of view. So, um, I'll skip over these quickly. So, the, the goal of the shift from project to product is that we stop basically having these bookends of the business and this, this water scrum fall model and everything we track is around flow and value delivery. Um, we stop having visibility go through this, layer, this proxy layer of projects and activities and actually have direct visibility on what's being delivered through these product value streams. We change you know, how we look at, at budgets, right? Uh, Stuart mentioned this kind of con continual funding models a lot that companies do. It's not to say, by the way, as an example, we define our budgets, our R&D our budget annually, but every quarter at TASTOP, we will actually reallocate between product value streams. Right? If, if one team, you, you know, you need, we need an extra team here, well then hire on the team there, not hire over here depending on business results. Microsoft does this every six months and they're looking at actually doing it more frequently. So you, you can do these kinds of things even within annual funding models. Again, if you've got your product value streams defined, your metrics defined, and then again, you, uh, uh, you, you can allocate accordingly. And this absolutely key one is that you stop bringing work to, you know, basically, bringing people to work by assigning them to work on all these applications. You instead have your product value stream supported by one to 10 teams um, have work brought to them where they're responsible for driving business results through owning this, this, this application portfolio. And the other really key one is that you, you it, this, and this goes back to this notion of business value. So I wanna make sure I, I, I leave you on this one, which is that the way that you think about your, and back to that, question as well on, on how you define products um, is there are different types of products with different business results as their goals. So there's just this massive overfixation on the external customer facing products in most IT organizations. Um, then there, because underneath those, you've got the platform products that underpin them, right? Those are the data pipeline, the APIs, the shared services. And then you've actually got your value stream network, your tool chain, your practices themselves as a product. And if you look at a successful tech company or a tech giant, uh, they have a tremendous investment at the bottom layers. So take Microsoft, 3,500 people work in developer division at that bottom layer, compared to 30, 50 in, in organizations with $100 million IT budgets. Um, because this is, just like BMW, Microsoft knows that its most important product is not one of the cars, it's the plant. So we have to basically drive investment down into the value stream network itself as a product. Um, and this is where ways of work can come in, investments in agile and methodologies and tools and so on happen. Um, the platform products that support all the business products and then the business products themselves, right? We can't have, Google has its highest paid developers down here. Most IT organizations have them up here. So this shift by tracking these flow metrics and dependencies between product value streams, you actually end up making, and I'm seeing this, this is very exciting, seeing this over and over again, you just end up having a business case to drive investment lower down in the stack. Where these products, by the way, the way our customers are measuring them, um, is for example, through how many, uh, with the usage of this new data pipeline API is by the business products, right? It does not have an external business metric, it just has an internal business metric. Here, you measure things by how happy the developers are, right? If you've got thousands of developers, that's a pretty important uh, uh, customer population to make happy. 
because in the end, they're, they're the ones delivering on your, on your success. So um, that's really the goal of the flow framework. I'll, um, well, I'll, I'll pause for some questions there. Yeah? How do you, uh, what you so you, one of your principles was around uh, people working on a single value stream, and you gave the three examples of the products there. Yeah. What's your experience of you about contribution models to value streams outside of the one you're working on? So a good example in my context is you might have developers that are working at the business product level to then contribute to the underlying developer platforms if they need the tool chain to be enhanced for some capability. So they're effectively working across yeah. multiple value chains, right? Yeah, so basically you want to minimize that by making the product value streams as independent as possible because in the end, dependencies between product value streams slow you down. Uh, when you have dependencies, of course, you know, a, a great model for that is each internal product value stream, like some API, has its own roadmap, has its own backlog. If someone's not getting to your API, because chances are it's understaffed, they're actually able to take pull requests, yeah. right? So you, you do that kind of contribution model, but you don't use it as a band-aid for underinvestment okay. in the APIs, right? Because if you've got all of these five business products who are doing all the work for this one API and they're waiting for their pull request to be reviewed, that's a sign of an underinvestment in a platform product and it'll show up in your flow efficiency. So. Yep. I just got a question about where, where you recommend starting. Because this is very much a kind of a systems thinking holistic uh, approach which looks at the entire value stream, um, which I would imagine requires the, the engagement of really senior folks in, in an organization. I'm wondering if, if perhaps a good place to start would be to pick a certain value stream, take this approach with this, prove it better, and so on. Yeah, absolutely. You, yeah. No, I think a great way to start is, is pick one, two, or three product value streams. Again, roughly the size I described. Uh, ideally, something important to the business so you demonstrate a measurable result. And that's so peop, you know, people see once you start tracking these flow metrics, removing impediments, that you actually you, you are driving to result. You're, you are driving more innovation. So abs absolutely. There's another question. I was going to ask a question about uh, with Warby mapping, you normally can have the uh, Genesis Bespoke product utility along the bottom. Have you ever tried to think what's tried to map the business platform value stream network on that, those same axes? Because normally in a Warby map, the further you get away from like, the customer value at the top, you generally move towards the right, towards more utility and kind of commodity style services. But we're saying here that investing heavily in the, the value stream network. That seems like contradicts it, I, I do believe it contradicts it some. So I think because, you know, again, how would BMW go about thinking the plant? Is that delivering direct value to the customer? No. That would imply they should actually be outsourcing their plant, basically, which is exactly contradictory to this. Yes. And so this is a key thing. You know, of course, you, wanna, you don't want to recreate the wheel, right? You don't want to create your own cloud. You don't want to create your, you know, you don't want to recreate Jenkins, even though I'm sure someone in your company does, <laughs> or Jira. Uh, <laughs> Because uh, it's fun to do, um, but but your you know basically those layers down your value stream network is core to you. It is your differentiator, right? It is why tech giants and tech companies invest so much in that. Um, it's just it's cut the customer is not the external customer. The customer is all the people and uh, uh, producing the software. Yeah. It's almost like if you actually try to draw the entire value stream on <coughs> yes. a single kind of warding map. It yeah. will actually kind of misguide you. It's better to take snapshots in each kind of different context. Yes. And then it'll actually map down more. Yeah. And I think and that's why the approach I've taken is to say that those, th there are internal product value streams and they have a customer. And the customer can be part of the business. The customer can be HR. The customer can be developers, your developers. And th they're really, really important. Yeah. I think that Simon says though that uh, it's, a, it's a, his maps are a guide. They're yeah. not like explicit, are yeah. they? So you know they're open to interpretation. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. Could the um, internal product value be measured um, as a proportion of the external product value? Say you were trying to you know redevelop Jenkins and come up with a new automated build pipeline. You're doing that for a reason that reflects on. Um, on the customer value, right? So you're trying to enable your customer facing developers to be able to build things more quickly and more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So everything feeds into those. And can you take that the OKR approach almost where everyone else's um, objective, objectives become components of 
a wider objective, and that wider objective is a customer facing value. Yeah, I think the answer to that is yes. That, that's, that's absolutely what we do. So before we invest in a process change or a tool chain or a tool purchase and so on, um, I'll give you a concrete example. So uh, four years ago, uh, we had some, we consume a ton of open source, we contribute to a ton of open source at Tastop, okay? Uh, and we had some manual license review processes, right? So because we measured how much, what the wait times those introduced for the product value streams, we realized that spending uh, tens of thousands of dollars a year on some automatic scanning software where our build pipeline breaks if someone you know, commits a, an incompatible license like GPL, the pipeline stops. There was a very clear business case because it would increase, it would decrease the flow time of, you know, of, of multiple product value streams. So that is absolutely how we think about it. To do it with, you know, not to say that's super easy to construct that business case, but at least if you're using, again, a value metric, it becomes easier to drive those, those internal investments. So, and again, I think that's the thing that's, that's missing. Once you've got this framework, it makes it much, much easier to create those business cases. And I think that's really important. Let's take one more question, and then I think we we start wrapping up. And um, I think it's very customary to show our appreciation for the value that you've given us by <laughs> taking down the pub afterwards <laughs> and, and getting you drunk as, as we did. Um, so, any last question? Yes. Yeah. Within the um, flow distribution, in the book, do you go into anywhere you allocate the investment in the taxonomy, so I can look at the features, going above the features, enter properties. Do you have any recommendations for where you might be looking at investment? So that, okay, yeah, that's an interesting question. That depends on how you do your business plan and your strategic planning. Yeah. So what we do at Tastop, what a lot of tech companies do right up to the size of Microsoft is through you know, a methodology called objective key results. I've been doing that for nine years. It's one approach, but we basically, the, the way we, act, we approach it is you know, we take our flow metrics here, just as an example, you know, we want to demonstrate that we, we're able to double our velocity without increasing FTEs on this one product value stream by fixing our testing and code review process, which we defined eight years ago and for some insane reason never revisited because we thought it was so great. Um, and, and maybe because I, I defined it and it was a disaster in the end. Um, so w what we actually do is we take our OKRs, we take our flow metrics, and we review them quarterly with the board, we review them monthly with um, the organization, and of course the teams do, do, do things every sprint. So it, it really just becomes a case, let me get the flow framework diagram up, it just really becomes a case, there, there is something bigger, um, but that truly is your buckets of planning. So it might be a strategic initiative, it might be you know, a, a new product launch, it might be aspects of your transformation, um, but in the end, they really define the plan for driving this value metric. For us, it, it's OKRs. So every product value stream has its own set of OKRs that rolls up into the company OKRs. Yeah. So the tenure of the Exactly. So you go, t yeah, 10, 5, 3, 1, and so on. Yeah, exactly. And just finally on that then, so the, the defects, risks, and debt. But it does, this doesn't help you with it. No, no, not at all, no, but it's, it's interesting to see how, how your mind and your experience comes across that. Because at the moment we're in British Telecom, and that's the challenge that we've got. We prior to that, I was at Barclays with John, yeah, and uh, Lloyd's, <laughs> all the same problem. Yeah, but um, you're all at Barclays. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone's gone through that, so I was, I was part of that kind of pivoting portfolio team, which was So my final part here, the defects, risk, and debt, we could generally allocate those against the features. So you would build back a heat map against the feature. No, th so these are all first class. So what we do is when we do our quarterly planning, so there'll be some OKR, right? We want to launch this new product. We want to you know, drive the number of users on it. We want to win more customers and so on. Uh, so there'll be that OKR is the kind of the, the, you know, the business blueprint for what we're doing um, that came from the annual plan that turned into the quarterly plan and so on. So it's a fairly typical cycle. And then when we're doing the release planning every quarter, the teams take that, and this is really important. We don't push it top down. So the product value stream and its teams under it, so there's one, one head of the product value stream, the teams under it, they take it and they, they basically propose their roadmap yeah. for the next release. You can do this as a PI and safe and so on. Um, and they say, well, to get to the business result, 
for this year, and it's actually pretty important that you then have the one year and the three year, right? Because then it allows them to say, we need to spend the next six months doing zero features. And of course, people grumble and so on, but, but they, they then have a reason to say, well, the only way we're actually going to get to the level of quality or scale that we need on this product value stream is to spend six months working on this testing platform and redoing how we test, and then start cranking out feature delivery, and then start hiring more developers. Or, yeah. And then by, you know, you're not, you're not as short-sighted as kind of, you know, PI to PI or release plan to release plan. If you've got that annual plan and the teams are responsible for, and this is what they do, they define their flow distribution up front for the release. And they say, you know, this much is going to go to feature delivery. This much is going to go to tech debt reduction. So, and that's why dovetailing it into your planning system allows them to actually make that argument. And again, stops, gets you out of this tyranny of just feature, 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 while your debt is going up and up. So, uh, But then the corollary of that is, if the team doesn't come up with a good case for why to reduce that tech debt, if it's not going to, because you know, we've got lots of teams and super smart people who love making frameworks just for fun. Um, <laughs> so if, if they don't have a business case for that, how that's going to help us, let's say, scale to X more customers, um, then we might, we probably won't take on all that API and tech debt reduction work because th there's not a reason to do it. And maybe we're okay with, you know, leaving this bit of legacy around. So. Yes,